All right, without further ado, welcome Dr. Robert Hobbes. Thank you very much for those kind words. It is a great honor for me to be speaking here today on such an anniversary. What I'd basically like to do today is to explore the achievements and the influence of Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov, whose centenary we mark today. I mean, in particular, I'd like to reflect on three aspects of Sakharov's public life. First, his role as a moral leader of the dissident movement in the Soviet Union. Second, his contribution to international human rights, um, in particular to what became known as the international human rights boom of the 1970s, the moment when human rights became a major issue in international affairs. Um, and third, I'll look at Sakharov's emergence as a leader of the movement for democracy in the Soviet Union um, and his enduring importance for those struggling against authoritarianism in Russia today. I'm not a scientist, and so I won't have much to say about Sakharov's immense achievements in the fields of theoretical physics and quantum mechanics. Um, I'll have nothing to say about his ideas about induced gravity, quarks, baryon asymmetry, or the peaceful uses of nuclear fusion. There is no doubt that Sakharov was one of the most brilliant scientists of the 20th century, um, and that he made an enduring contribution to our understanding of the universe. Nor will I have much to say about Sakharov's involvement with thermonuclear weapons. Sakharov is often regarded as the father of the Soviet H-bomb, um, but no less remarkable was his contribution to influence international efforts to limit the effects of those weapons. Um, the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty, um, signed in Moscow in 1963, was partly made possible by Sakharov's insistent lobbying um, behind the scenes for such a um, treaty. These achievements are not my subject, but they are nevertheless essential for an understanding of Sakharov's career as a dissident and a human rights activist. And they've left their mark both on his ideas and on his activism. Um, Sakharov's background as a scientist and his involvement with doomsday weapons influenced his theories about the relationship between intellectual freedom and scientific progress. And Sakharov's status as a pillar of the Soviet scientific establishment probably bought him time. From the early 1970s, Sakharov was the target of unrelenting harassment and intermittent vilification campaigns, but he enjoyed nearly a decade of, uh, as an outspoken dissident before he was arrested and sentenced to internal exile in the closed city of Gorky. Um, there are uh, uh, Politburo records where Brezhnev complains that we just tolerated Sakharov for so long. Um, that tolerance wasn't because Brezhnev was a nice man. It was a, a testimony to Sakharov's importance for the Soviet system. Um, and that tolerance bought Sakharov time during which he did things and said things that mattered. Sakharov's trajectory from the heights of the Soviet scientific establishment to the condition of a persecuted dissident began in the autumn of 1966 when he signed a petition against changes to the Soviet criminal code that made it easier to prosecute people for anti-Soviet agitation. A few months later, on the 5th of December, he attended the second Constitution Day demonstration in Moscow's Pushkin Square. These gatherings and annual protest against the trampling of the rights enshrined in the Soviet constitution became the central event in the calendar of Soviet dissidents and Sakharov became a regular participant in them. These acts of courage did not go unnoticed by the KGB, but Sakharov was still part of the Soviet establishment. He was still working at the Arzenus 16 nuclear research facility. He was still someone who enjoyed all the privileges of a member of the Soviet nomenclatura. 
Sakharov's emergence as an individual dissenting voice dates to the appearance of his celebrated essay, Reflections on Progress, Peaceful Coexistence, and Intellectual Freedom, which circulated in Samostat before being smuggled to the West and published in leading newspapers around the world. This essay is eclectic and defies summary, but three points are worth noticing, uh, are worth noting. First, Sakharov argued that nuclear annihilation and ecological disaster could be averted by the convergence of the socialist and the capitalist systems. Second, Sakharov asserted the importance of intellectual freedom, both for the advancement of knowledge and for ensuring that states were accountable to their own populations. And third, he specifically criticized the post-Khrushchev crackdown on dissent. Um, he condemned the effects of censorship, he, he condemned the banning of Solzhenitsyn's novels and the imprisonment of the writers Daniel and Sinyavsky. And he uh, devoted to uh, the paragraphs of this essay to the um, famous ginsburg Golanskov trial of early 1968. This challenge to the Soviet regime provoked the, the regime's first reprisals against him. And when he rejected an, an opportunity to recant the essay, to denounce its publication in the West, he was fired um, from Arzen's 16, um, where he'd worked since the early 1950s. Sakharov's so entry into the world of the dissidents um, uh, his entry into the world of the dissident rights defenders was made possible by his acquaintance with Valery Chalitza, um, the editor of a Samostat journal called Social Problems, um, which was focused on the law and human rights. And at uh, Chalitza's prompting, Sakharov became involved in the defense of victims of psychiatric repression, like General Pyotr Grigorenko and Joris Medvedev. And he also began to attend the trials of dissidents. This growing activism took institutional form later that year when Sakura became a founding member of one of the first dissident NGOs, um, Chalitza's Moscow Committee for Human Rights. And this was basically a kind of weekly workshop in Chalitza's apartment to discuss papers on legal and human rights issues, which were then published in Chalitza's journal. But in a totalitarian state where every association had to be registered with the authorities. It was a radical step. To quote a report to the Central Committee from KGB Chairman Yuri Andropov, Sakharov was activating his politically harmful activity. For some observers, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, Sakharov was wasting his time, but it did not seem so to Sakharov. Um, Chiliza gave him an education in human rights and its possibilities, and that education shaped Sakharov's subsequent career. The next red line that Sakharov crossed was reaching out to the West, first by establishing links with Western human rights activists, then giving interviews to journalists, and then meeting diplomats and visiting politicians. In the paranoid world of the KGB, this meant, to quote an Andropov memorandum from June 1972, that Sakharov's antisocial activity was objectively linking to the subversive activity of the enemy's ideological centers. And the uh, uh, regime issued a kind of final warning to Sakharov in August 1973, when he was summoned to the office of the Deputy Prosecutor General, Mikhail Mal Malyarov, um, who threatened him with criminal charges for his allegedly anti-Soviet activity. Sakharov responded by calling his first press conference, attended by some 30 foreign journalists. And it was here that Sakharov threw down the gauntlets um, by criticizing the terms of US-Soviet detente for failing to promote the democratization of Soviet society and instead cultivating and encouraging a closed society that was becoming a threat um, to peace. The regime reacted to this continuing defiance by unleashing a massive propaganda campaign um, against Sakharov, which was launched by a, a collective letter from 40 academicians on the 29th of August 1973 and during the weeks that followed Sakharov was vilified every day in the pages of major newspapers um, which devoted countless columns to collective letters from workplaces across the country 
all filled with hate for this enemy of peace, this renegade um, cut off from the Soviet people. It is unlikely, however, that this orchestrated display of the anger of the Soviet people achieved its desired goal. And we know from the presidential archives that the newspaper Izviestia sent a report to the Central Committee about letters received from readers about the campaign. And this was already a very selective um, sample of public opinion because if you're actually putting something on record um, in a totalitarian state, um, that in itself requires some courage. And of the 809 letters received by Izviestia, according to this report, 402, nearly half, had a negative and sometimes an anti-Soviet character. In other words, about half of those who responded were rejecting the campaign. This onslaught against Asakharov emerged with a, a, um, a campaign against the Solzhenitsyn, which had been triggered by the um, publication of the Gulag Archipelago. Um, Within a few months, Solzhenitsyn was arrested and deported to West Germany. The effect was to leave Sakharov as the remaining towering moral figure of the dissident movement within the borders of the Soviet state. <clears throat> it is difficult to exaggerate Sakharov's importance for the dissident movement during the dozen years before Perestroika. Um, this the dissident movement was the movement of citizens who defended victims of repression, who conducted an uncensored debate about major issues, um, who articulated alternative ideas and programs and possibilities, and who generally acted like free people in an unfree society. And Sakharov was at once a symbol of this movement, its most prominent activist, and its most influential thinker. And to, uh, in uh, particularly, there are three reasons why Sakharov mattered to the dissident movement. First, he was famous, really, really famous. And particularly after Solzhenitsyn's departure, no other dissident rivaled his prominence or his authority. As an, uh, um, uh, as an academician, as a brilliant scientist, as a public figure with an international reputation, as a kind of moral hero to millions of people around the world, Sakharov could not be dismissed as a marginal renegade. Moreover, his prominence gave him the capacity to draw attention to the, the fate of victims of uh, injustice and repression. One measure of his role as an intercessor was the um, avalanche of mail that he started to receive when he um, began working with the Moscow Human Rights Committee. Um, Many of these letters were eventually answered by the dissident lawyer Sofia Kalistrafova, but Sakharov read them all and signed each response, and this gave him a tremendous insight into the problems of Soviet society. A second reason why Sakharov was important for the dissident movement was that the breadth of his rights defence activities and the range of the victims that he defended made him a unifying figure. He defended people from the most different walks of life. He defended Crimean Tatars, he defended Ukrainians, he defended Lithuanians, he defended Armenians, he defended Jewish refuseniks, he defended Baptists um, uh, and Seventh-day Adventists, he defended Volga Germans, um, to uh, name only some of the most obvious. And he defended countless dissidents and um, rights defenders, those who uh, were languishing in prisons and labor camps and psychiatric hospitals. Third, Sakharov is important because he set a model for dissident conduct and ethics. And it's important to remember, in the winter of 1973 to 74, the dissident rights defense movement in the Soviet Union appeared to be on the verge of collapse. The movement's main publication, the, the Chronicle of Current Events, had ceased publication in 1972. Two very prominent dissidents, Pyotr Yakir and Viktor Krasin, had confessed to collaborating with anti-Soviet um, ideological centers in a show trial and other dissidents were agreeing to withdraw from public activity in return for the uh, uh, release of arrested comrades. And this was the background against which Sakharov started to become more publicly outspoken. Despite the storm of vilification whirling around him, despite threats and 
real violent acts of harassment. I mean, he was visited both by threatening um, Russian ultranationalists and by self-styled Palestinian terrorists. Um, despite the harassment of his family, Sahar remained defiant and fearless. Under pressure, he became more, not less, critical of the regime. And he spoke out and acted tirelessly in defence of others, in defence of victims of, of repression. When the spotlight was on him, Sakhar set an example of how a dissident rights defender should behave in the face of persecution. That example mattered to others. In these three ways, Sakhar helped the dissident movement to withstand the successive crackdowns, the waves of of repression that gradually eroded its public structures and decimated the ranks of its most prominent representatives. This circumstance is important not because the dissidents destroyed the Soviet system. They did not. Um, it matters because their activity helped to map, map out some of the vectors of Russia's post-Soviet ideological debates and developments. Um, what was discussed in the dissident milieu and what rights defenders like Sakharov had campaigned for became formative influences on, um, both on post-Soviet politics and post-Soviet civil society. And Sakharov's defiance helped to make this possible. Sakharov's second major achievement lies in the arena of international human rights. And in particular, it lies in his contribution to what historians today call the international human rights boom of the 1970s. This is the moment when human rights became part of global <coughs> consciousness and a major factor in international diplomacy. It was not so when Sakharov began to use the term human rights in the 1970s. Then the term was so esoteric, so obscure that Western journalists often mistranslated his uses of it as the rights of man, a term going back to the French Revolution. Um, the United Nations General Assembly may have voted for a universal declaration of human rights in 1948, but for the next two decades, human rights was the arcane preserve of a small number of diplomats at the UN. Partly, this was because the UN was increasingly dominated by an informal coalition of um, democratic regimes. The, um, the Afro-Asian bloc, the so-called non-aligned movement, and the Soviet bloc. Partly it was because the United States had its own problems with racial segregation, and countries like Britain and France were dealing with um, the problems of decolonization. Western governments at this time simply didn't want to talk about human rights because they knew that it would turn out badly, that they would get criticised very harshly. Um, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who served as US ambassador to the UN in the mid-1970s, later reflected, as a tactical or strategic concern of foreign policy, human rights had disappeared so completely from the councils of the West that a newcomer to the field might well never have heard the issue even discussed. It may serve to record just how nearly total this blackout on human rights had become. And it was Soviet dissidents who started to use this arcane, obscure, almost forgotten concept. We can see it appearing in protests about the political trials of the late 1960s, it appears on the cover of, the, of every issue of the chronicle um, of the current events, the most important publication of the Soviet rights defense movement. And a um, uh, year after the um, first appearance of the chronicle, Sergei Kavalyov and other members of the um, new initiative group for human rights in the USSR actually sent an appeal to the UN's um, the Human Rights Commission with what was then a completely bizarre, almost insanely bizarre idea that this commission could actually show some concern for political prisoners in the Soviet Union. Um, the only result of this petition was an order from the UN Secretary General never again to, for to forward to him any human rights petitions. Um, but Sakharov took this human rights concept and he ran with it. And in particular, he connected it to his ideas about peace, about totalitarianism, 
and about the future of the world. The evolution of um, Sartre's thinking about human rights took place in three stages. First, as, as we've seen, Sartre became increasingly critical of, um, uh, uh, of detente, of the re relaxation of tensions between the West and the Soviet bloc. In particular, he was critical of what he called detente, in which the West accepts the rules of the game. This was detente that was based on realist conceptions of the national interest, utterly divorced from democratic values or any concern for human rights. And what this meant in practice was exemplified by Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev's visit to France in 1971, when French police welcomed the Soviet leader by rounding up 58 prominent East European emigre intellectuals um, and flew them to Corsica, where they were held in a hotel under house arrest until Brezhnev left. This weird hospitality helped to set the tone for US-Soviet detente, which Nixon and Brezhnev launched in May 1972 with a declaration of principles that committed the signatories to develop normal relations based on the principles of sovereignty, non-interference in internal affairs, and mutual advantage. And every time that the um, US president um, visited Moscow um, in accordance with this declaration, he was very careful to say nothing about the, uh, about the Nixon roundups, the detention of prominent dissidents for the duration of his stay. More, uh, a um, more ominous aspect of this um, detente policy um, in which the West accepted the um, rules of the game was a, a push to shut down um, Western institutions that supported dissidents behind the Iron Curtain. This was a time when the very influential US Senator um, William Fulbright um, was campaigning for the closure of Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe because, in his words, it is simply not within the legitimate range of our foreign policy to instruct the Russians in how to treat their own people. During 1973, Sarkar became increasingly critical of this version of detente without human rights, detente in which the West accepts the rules of the game. And in a, a series of public statements, he argued that this approach was counterproductive, that it was making the world actually less safe. And his most radical step was his open letter to the US Congress, um, which he expressed, he expressed his support for a bold and innovative human rights initiative, the jackson Bannock Amendment. Under the terms of this draft legislation, the implementation of a proposed US-Soviet um, trade agreement would be made conditional on an end to restrictions on immigration. The, Amendment was, fearless, uh, was fiercely resisted by US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who regarded criticism of any aspect of the Soviet regime or its conduct as a threat to the progress of US Soviet detente. In his letter, Sakharov contested Kissinger's reasoning by arguing, um, by arguing that the denial of the right to immigrate made the Soviet Union a closed society a closed society that wasn't accountable to its own people and that was therefore potentially a danger to peace and to the world. And this was a historic intervention. Um, as Henry Kissinger later admitted, Sakharov's letter opened the floodgates. And the adoption of the jackson vanick Amendment by Congress in 1974 became a turning point in the incorporation of human rights into US foreign policy. No less important was the influence of Sarkov's ideas on the Helsinki process, a series of conferences on security and cooperation in Europe. If Sarkov had a, a basic credo, um, a, a fundamental conviction, it was this, that peace and human rights are inextricably connected. Um, states that respected human rights the human rights of their own people, of their own citizens, would respect international order. As Sakharov explained in his Nobel lecture, I am convinced that international trust, mutual understanding, disarmament, and international security are inconceivable without an open society, with freedom of information, 
freedom of conscience, the right to publish, and the right to travel and choose the country in which one chooses to live. And for Sakharov, this idea lay at the core of the Helsinki process, the series of um, east-west diplomatic conferences that were inaugurated by the signing of the Helsinki Final Act in August 1975 by 35 states from Europe and North America. In his Nobel address, Sakharov drew attention to the fact that the text contained far-reaching declarations on the relationship between international security and the preservation of human rights. This was certainly not a dominant opinion at the time. The vast majority of Western observers, um, as uh, well as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, saw the Helsinki Final Act as a catastrophic defeat for the West because it appeared to recognize Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. But Sakharov's insight was a major influence on Anatoly Sharansky, the prominent refusenik and, uh, and Jewish dissident. Sharansky was working as a, a translator for um, Sakharov in his meetings with Western journalists. And, um, Sharansky has described Sakharov as his teacher. Um, and it was Sharansky, in turn, who suggested to Yuri Arulov, um, the physicist, that they create a group to monitor the implementation of the, of the Helsinki Accords in the Soviet Union. The result was the establishment of the Moscow Helsinki Group, an organization made up of um, many prominent dissidents, um, including Sakharov's own wife, Yelena Bornov. And for nearly eight years, the Moscow Helsinki Group sent meticulous reports about Soviet violations of the Accords to the follow-up conferences of, uh, of Helsinki signatory states. But these groups' most compelling evidence of Soviet violations was the brutal repression inflicted on its own members and of other Helsinki monitoring groups for the very fact of trying to observe the implementation of an agreement signed by their own government. And it was primarily thanks to the efforts of these monitors that the Helsinki process became what one US diplomat later described as a court trial in continuous session of the Soviet Union and its satellites. And the the prosecution case in that um, court trial was certainly magnified by the Kremlin's decision to silence its most famous dissenter. In particular, the, the um, Reagan administration in the United States spoke out very loudly in defense of Sakharov. Um, Sakharov's fate was the subject of numerous US congressional uh, resolutions, which um, in 1983 prompted US President Ronald Reagan to proclaim the 21st of May as National uh, Sakharov Day. Um, and appearing alongside representatives of both parties in the US Congress, Reagan declared that Andrei Sakharov speaks for those in the Soviet Union and elsewhere who yearn for the fulfillment of their human rights. No one knows this better than those who now attempt to stifle his spirit to silence him. Rulers of totalitarian states, however great the danger that they pose to the rest of mankind, are aware of the shakiness of their rule and the fragility of their claims of legitimacy. And that's why they seek to stifle dissent. And that's why we must never stand by in silence as they do. And this is only one of countless statements, both public and private, by Reagan and members um, of his administration, both about Sakharov and echoing Sakharov's ideas about the interconnection of peace and human rights. These statements were also much more than propaganda. They also communicated to the Soviet leadership that something fundamental had changed in superpower relations. Um, in 1977, when the newly elected US President Jimmy Carter had exchanged letters with Sakharov and spoken out against human rights abuses behind the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union had retaliated by suspending cooperation in other fields. Carter had tried to disengage human rights from other aspects of the relationship. He thought that he could say, um, uh, 
uh, he could criticize oppression behind the Iron Curtain whilst continuing to discuss disarmament and security issues with the, the Soviet leadership. And it was the, the Soviet regime that insisted on linkage that said, if you talk about human rights, we're not going to talk to you about other stuff. But under Reagan, the situation was reversed. It was the United States that was insisting on linkage, effectively endorsing Sarkar's insight about the interconnect interconnectedness of peace and human rights. And this linkage was repeatedly articulated by US ambassadors um, at the Helsinki follow-up conferences in Madrid, Vienna, Ottawa, and Bern. Consider this speech by US Ambassador Richard Shifter at the Ottawa CSE conference. We believe that performance in the field of human rights is inextricably linked to all aspects of improved bilateral relations. And recalling the cases of Sakharov, Yelena Bonner, Arulov, Sharansky, and others, he observed that these individuals did not plot to overthrow the government of the Soviet Union. They did not even engage in what we would consider normal political activity in the West. That is, organized to make changes in the government by peaceful means. They did nothing other than receive and impart information, a right explicitly guaranteed through the Helsinki Final Act. Our people have a right to wonder, declared Shifter, whether a country that fails to keep its word in matters unrelated to considerations of security will do so when its security as is at stake. This international pressure was the background against which Mikhail Gorbachev became um, the general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party. And we know from documents um, released in the 1990s by the Presidential Archive that the Sakharov case had become a major preoccupation of the Soviet authorities. On the one hand, there was a steady stream of reports from Viktor Chebrikov, the chairman of the KGB, about Sakharov's supposed contacts with Western so-called ideological centers and about Soviet efforts to counteract these, um, uh, the campaigns around the name of Sakharov. On the other hand, um, um, these archival documents reveal an increasingly rational discussion of the Sakharov case. Okay, when Sakharov wrote his letter to Gorbachev in the autumn of 1986, the Politburo basically agreed to allow him to return. Um, KGB chairman Chibrikov um, did draw attention to Sakharov's insistence that he would not remain silent, but um, that, uh, that he would continue to speak out if he were allowed to return, but others dismissed this. And um, Gorbachev reflected that if we had spoken with Sakharov earlier, perhaps this situation would never have emerged. This slow process leading to Sakharov's release was accelerated by two developments. The first was a proposal by the Soviet foreign minister for the holding of a, a Helsinki follow-up conference on humanitarian issues in Moscow. So Gorbachev is trying to take the offensive on human rights. And the, the second was the death in Chistopol prison of Anatoly Mavchenko, a legendary dissident, the author of the famous prison memoirs and a member of the Moscow Helsinki group. And it was in the wake of these events that Gorbachev made arguably the most famous telephone call in Soviet history. Personally, the leader of the Soviet state calling the country's most reviled dissident um, and asking him to return to Moscow and resume his patriotic work. After his return to Moscow, Sakharov resumed his patriotic work in two ways. The first was to take up his old vocation of rights defender. Um, his apartment became a kind of clearing house for dissidents returning from prison and exile. And he also became a, vocif a vociferous critic of the um, painfully slow pace of the amnesty process. Um, but their first face-to-face -face meeting in January 1988, um, Sakharov handed Gorbachev a list of political prisoners who were still languishing in the gulag. And um, controversially, Sakharov also encouraged um, those still in um, captivity to apply for pardons to 
accelerate their release. The second thing Sakharov did was to exploit the opportunities offered by Perestroika to promote his ideas and ultimately to promote the democratization of the Soviet system. Soon after his return from Gorky, he participated in um, uh, Gorbachev's forum for a nuclear free world and he um, began to cooperate with an array of reformist intellectuals, the so-called foreman of the Perestroika. Um, in 1988, he joined them in the uh, discussion forum Moskovskaya Tribuna, um, and he um, contributed an article to the pro-Perestroika anthology Inovodny Dana. This apparent convergence with um, the priorities of the loyalist intelligentsia was harshly criticized by Alexander Podrobinek, um, one of the most courageous and uncompromising Soviet dissidents. But in hindsight, it's clear that Sakharov played an important role in the intellectual evolution, in, in the radicalization of many of these loyalist intellectuals. They fell under the sway of his ideas and example rather than vice versa. They evolved while Sakharov remained true to his principles. This process was exemplified by the transformation of Memorial, an informal group that had rapidly evolved into a public movement and one of the most significant forces in the Soviet Union's burgeoning civil society. Memorial was originally launched with the sole objective of constructing a monument to the victims of Stalinism, a project that was entirely consistent with the official de-Stalinization that had been resumed by Gorbachev. But um, Memorial began to change in um, 1988 um, at about the time that Sakharov became its chairman. Um, the Sakharov's formal role was honorary, but he certainly didn't treat it that way. Um, and at a time when the authorities were putting pressure on Memorial by obstructing its founding conference and instigating splits in its ranks and trying to pr promote an alternative organization that was doing the same thing, Sakharov was a fierce and uncompromising defender of its independence um, and a determined advocate of the expansion of its goals from the construction of a monument. Almost all of the people on the Presidium of Memorial's founding conference in early 1989 were pro-perestroika intellectuals who'd only begun to speak out about the darker sides of um, Soviet reality when it was safe to do so. Sakharov brought the moral authority and the human rights agenda of the dissident rights defenders into Memorial. And thanks to his energetic participation, Memorial became one of the most resilient and authoritative custodians of the legacy of those dissident rights defenders um, and of the human rights cause in post-Soviet Russia. What transformed Sakharov, the dissident, into a leader of a movement for democracy in the Soviet Union was his participation in the Congress of People's Deputies, the semi-democratic legislature that was elected in the spring of 1989. For its two weeks of, of um, sessions in the, uh, uh, in the summer of 1989, the Congress transfits the country. And Despite the fact that um, Sakharov had chosen not to seek um, a, a popular mandate and was chosen for one of the seats reserved for the Academy of Sciences, um, he was a central figure in the Congress. Um, no other deputy rivaled Sakharov's role as an advocate of systemic change, of a transition from a one-party totalitarian state to a pluralist democracy. From the outset, from his very first speech, Sakharov demanded that the Congress assume the responsibilities of a legislature. He demanded that important decisions be debated rather than simply rubber stamped. And he exhorted his fellow deputies to proclaim the supremacy of the Congress. In other words, he called upon them to put an end to the supremacy of the Communist Party, the foundation of the totalitarian state. And uh, Sakharov expanded this argument in his speech to the closing session of the Congress. This was the speech in which he lamented that the construction of the state had started with the root. Um, and he warned against the concentration of power in the hands of, of one man, in this case, Gorbachev. But these words were vindicated by Russia's post-Soviet development, where Yeltsin's um, super-presidential 
constitution, a constitution that concentrated powers in the executive, laid the foundations of Putin's dictatorship. Sakharov's alternative was clearly set out in his decree on power, a seven-point manifesto that began with the abolition of the Communist Party's leading role and then set out ways to assert the supremacy of the Congress by the creation of parliamentary commissions, by control over appointments and by the limitation of the KGB's functions to international security. For Sakharov, democracy meant a strong parliament. What magnified Sakharov's impact at the Congress was the hysterical denunciation directed against him by what Yuri Afanasyev called the aggressively obedient majority. The pretext was his mentioning of reports that Soviet helicopters in Afghanistan had killed captured soldiers to prevent them being used as hostages. And in an obviously orchestrated attempt to discredit Sakharov, a succession of former military officers and um, Party functionaries and hardliners went to the podium on the 2nd of June, 1989, to accuse him of slandering the Soviet army. And they were egged on by shouting and historical applause from a large part of the audience. In his memoirs, Sakharov called this five minutes of hysteria in front of millions of viewers. The clear aim was to discredit Sakharov, but his calm defiance in the face of this ugly spectacle helped to transform him into a national moral figure, a representative of all of those who were repelled by this kind of, of hate obsession. One confirmation of Sakharov's impact at the um, Congress came from the then KGB ch chairman, uh, chairman Vladimir Kruchkov, who warned Gorbachev in a secret memorandum on the eve of the Second Congress that Sakharov's position as deputy had signified a change of status from lone rights defender to a leader of the opposition and had given him the possibility not only of propagandizing his ideological scheme, but of also of trying to put it into practice through other members of the interregional group, um, the group of um, uh, reformist deputies that had been established at the first Congress. Central to this ideological scheme was the creation of a genuine political opposition in the USSR. And Sakharov was one of the five co-chairpersons of the inter-regional group, the um, pro-reform group of deputies, which, um, as I've mentioned, was created during the First Congress. Many members of the inter-regional group saw themselves as radical advocates of perestroika. They were working to regenerate the Soviet experiment, to democratize it. They were focused on a struggle within the Communist Party. And their worldview was still framed by the Leninist heritage. Sakharov came from a completely different place. His years as a dissident, his meditations on the primacy of civil and political rights, and his deep understanding of totalitarianism led him to embrace the idea of opposition as a path to systematic change. For Sakharov, the Democrats of the Soviet Union needed to go further than the slogans of perestroika. They needed to assume the mantle of a political opposition. And um, this was the subject of Sakharov's last speech and addressed to the interregional group at around 3 p.m. on the 14th of December, 1989. Here, Sakharov argued that opposition was about responsibility. It was about not being responsible for the government's misguided policies that they were criticizing and it was about accepting responsibility for the measures that they proposed as an opposition. Sakharov's death that evening served as a catalyst for his colleagues to accept this challenge. And one of the first was Boris Yeltsin, who declared the following morning that we must come to the end of the path that Sakharov began. Our duty is to Sakharov's name, to the persecution he suffered. And Yeltsin was seconded by Yuri Afanasyev, who used his speech at Sakharov's funeral to exhort all Democrats to unite in one Andrei Sakharov democratic bloc. Later, Afanasyev reflected that we diverged from the official course of the Communist Party on questions of power, of property, of the national and state organization of the USSR. I think that without Andrei Dmitrievich, we would have wavered for a long time over those questions. His clear-cut statements, literally on the eve of the Second Congress, de facto led to the formation of a political opposition. The 
the genesis of that opposition can be traced to Sakharov's funeral, which became a major political event. Um, not so much because of the visit of Gorbachev and other mem and, um, members of the Politburo who paid their respects um, at the Academy of Sciences where Sakharov's body was laying in state, but because of the crowd of 40,000 people that accompanied his coffin to its final resting place. Many more uh, the many mourners held placards that paid tribute to Sakharov's last crusade. Um, some consisted of a, a crossed out six, um, the, the article of the Soviet constitution that enshrined the leading role of the Communist Party. In his report on the um, occasion, the KGB chairman Khrushchev com complained that speakers at the gathering had tried in essence to canonize the late academician, transforming him into a distinctive symbol of the struggle for the realization of the conditions of groups opposed to the CPSU, the Communist Party. It was perhaps for um, this reason that Yuri Afanasyev's call for the creation of an Andrei Sakharov block of democratic forces was not taken by anyone who knew Sakharov, who defended his ideas, or who'd even um, met him, um, it was taken up by the KGB. Um, the result was a bizarre organisation, the Andrei Sakharov Union of Democratic Forces, which was created behind closed doors under the leadership of one Vladimir Varonin, a shady figure with a criminal past who soon allied himself with Vladimir Zhirinovsky's Liberal Democratic Party in the centrist bloc. Um, and for some years, Varonin published a grotesque newspaper about Sakharov. I, I can remember... Um, seeing it being sold outside metro stations in Moscow in 1992. Um, a newspaper that was full of weird conspiracy theories about Yelena Borna's um, sinister role in his life. <clears throat> now, despite these efforts to, to, to sow confusion, there's no doubt that Sakharov became a potent symbol during the terminal crisis of the Soviet Union. Within a month of his death, Leading deputies of the interregional inter group had created an opposition, the Democratic Russia Bloc, an electoral alliance of parties and informal groups to contest the RSFSR um, uh, elections. And its founding document declared that the general political orientation of this wide association will be defined by the documents of the interregional group. The humanist ideas of our great contemporary Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov his proposed decree on power, and his draft constitution. This was more than political rhetoric. Um, after um, the um, democratic um, uh, 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 Russia bloc um, triumphed in those elections, um, uh, in uh, July 1990, the essence of Sakharov's decree on power was enshrined in an RSFSR decree on power, which opened with a declaration that power in the RSFSR belongs exclusively to the people and warned that any illegal intervention by political parties, party political organs and other public organisations in the activities of the organs of state power and administration must cease immediately. And the, the Sakharov constitution is to become the first document to be circulated among the members of the Russian parliament's new constitutional commission, which was established at, um, at the first... Um, RSFSR, Congress of People's Deputies, in June 1990. In the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Sakharov became a kind of symbol of um, Russia's democratic destiny. Um, the, um, uh, Yeltsin's presidential administration even held a major conference in 1994 um, to mark Sakharov's 73rd birthday. Um, this was in the aftermath of the constitutional crisis of October 1993, and this conference was clearly intended to um, uh, consolidate um, support for the regime and to um, indicate its um, uh, commitment to a democratic future. Sakharov's ideas about the interconnection between human rights and international security were a major influence on the early diplomacy of Russia's liberal foreign minister, Andrei Korsarev. Um, Korsarev pays explicit tribute to Sakharov in a um, uh, 1994 book, um, Prebrzhenia, um, and in his uh, speech to the UN's World Conference on Human Rights in 1993. The, the conference had established a kind of post-Cold War consensus about the 
universality of human rights. And this was a, a, a conference in which Russia and um, uh, much of um, former communist Eastern Europe sided with the Western democracies ag against the People's Republic of China um, and against um, authoritarian regimes that were opposed to um, the reform of the UN's human rights system. Uh, President Yeltsin himself repeatedly acknowledged his debt to Sakharov in his speeches. Um, Sakharov was my teacher in democracy, a teacher of democracy for all of Russia, he declared during the 1996 election campaign. Now, um, Sakharov may have been a great teacher. Clearly, in retrospect, Yeltsin was not a great student. Um, and these uh, deferential um, poses um, uh, certainly failed to prevent the breakdown of Yeltsin's relations with many of those closest to Sakharov. Um, people like Yelena Borner and Sergei Kavalyov after the invasion of Chechnya. But arguably, they also set limits to Yeltsin's backsliding. Um, for all of his shortcomings, and they were many, um, Yeltsin's flawed and, and corrupt democracy was an immeasurably freer political order than the authoritarian regime that followed. Certainly, Vladimir Putin, who experienced the democratic revolutions of 1989 as a personal trauma, is unlikely ever to acknowledge Sakharov as his teacher. It's, at various times, of course, the Putin regime has paid lip service to Sakharov's memory, and it's doing so today um, at this centenary. There's a commemorative two-ruble coin featuring Sakharov, and Putin has announced his support for a statue of Sakharov in Prospect. Sakharov. But whilst going through these motions, the Putin regime has repudiated Sakharov's legacy in a thousand ways. Most of the civil and political rights that Sakharov campaigned for have been nullified in practice. Russia is disengaging itself from the international the human rights institutions like the European Court of Human Rights and in the UN. Russia today works with communist China to lead a bloc of anti-Western states that oppose international scrutiny of their human rights records. And um, Russia's rights defense movement, including organizations like Memorial and the Sakharov Center, organizations that represent Sakharov's legacy are being vilified as foreign agents. At the same time, the Putin regime has promoted the ideas of Sakharov's radical nationalist and illiberal critics. Um, this process is exemplified by Natalia Narochnitskaya, the author of a massive pseudo-historical polemic full of crazy conspiracy theories that repeatedly vilifies Sakharov as infantile and as a destructive bearer of foreign values. And in 2009, Narachnitskaya was the keynote speaker at a Russian government-funded UN seminar on traditional values that signaled the beginning of a serious attempt led by Russia to undermine the post-Cold War human rights consensus reached at the UN's Vienna Conference. But for many of those who resisted Russia's descent into authoritarianism, Sakharov was a rallying point and inspiration. For instance, Sakharov was clearly a major influence on Boris Nemtsov, one of the leaders of the anti-Putin opposition until his assassination in 2015. Nemtsov's political destiny was shaped by his meetings with Sakharov in the late 1980s, and he would later reflect that frequently when finding myself in a difficult situation, I asked myself how Andrei Dmitri Dmitrovich would have reacted. It helps. And pr presumably that kind of reflection was one of the reasons why Unlike many leading members of the Union of Right Forces bloc, to which um, Nemtsov belonged between 2003 and 2008, um, Nemtsov did not seek an accommodation with the regime. He remained ab absolutely consistent in up upholding the um, democratic values um, and the principles that Sakharov stood for. Sakharov is also an important influence on the Strategy 31 movement, the monthly demonstrations in defense of Article 31 of the Constitution that guaranteed the right to freedom of assembly. Um, the instigator of Strategy 31, the national Bolshevik leader, Eduard Limonov, was an odious and repulsive figure in many ways, but 
He was perfectly right when he told liberal rights defenders that Sakharov would be with us. Um, and that um, uh, the Strategy 31 demonstrations in defense of a human rights article of the Constitution um, were a continuation of what Sakharov and the dissidents did. And this idea clearly inspired more admirable young um, Nets all activists like Matvey Krylov, who exhorted people to come to the demonstrations and follow the example of Sakharov, and many did, including Nemtsov, Navalny, and many um, uh, rights defenders. By following the example of Sakharov, they challenged the regime's control of public space and prepared the way for the protest movement that emerged in response to election fraud in December 2011. Perhaps the most important lesson of Sakharov's life is about the agency of Russian dissenters, about the fact that they played a crucial role in the making of international human rights. Contrary to a favorite line of Kremlin propagandists, liberal notions of human rights are not some imposition of Western or Anglo-Saxon imperialists. The West had to be pushed to take up the human rights banner, and it was Soviet dissenters, and above all, Andrei Sakharov, who did the pushing. In some ways, this should not surprise us. Citizens of totalitarian societies like Sakharov were in inevitably going to have a more acute sense of the value of international human rights than citizens of Western democracies who didn't have to worry about ending up in the gulag or a psychiatric hospital because they expressed an unpopular opinion or tried to exercise basic human rights. But this also testifies to the persistence of Russia's democratic tradition. Like Quite a few other important dissident rights defenders, Sakharov was connected by family ties to an earlier pre-revolutionary generation of Russian liberals for whom rights mattered. Sakharov famously said that the mole of history burrows unnoticed. Today, as the Putin regime cracks down on civil society, as the number of Russian political prisoners rises, the mole of history is burrowing. We do not know its destination. What we do know, however, is that if that destination is a freer and more democratic Russia, then the name of Andrei Sakharov will be honoured as its greatest precursor. Thank you. to uh, thank you on behalf of the Russian-speaking community of Melbourne uh, for this uh, very comprehensive and illuminating lecture on uh, Andrei Sakharov's uh, legacy. Um, I found it inspiring. I think lots of people, uh, lots of Russians right now uh, feel a bit dispirited about uh, the events uh, that are occurring in, in, in Russia under Putin's regime, the repression of uh, freedom of speech, of, uh, political expression and um, to see, to be reminded of the example of Sakharov who managed to be such a vocal opponent of the Communist Party when the Communist Party controlled everything uh, is uh, very inspirational. So uh, thank you very much for this lecture. I cannot think of a better way of celebrating uh, uh, Andrei Sakharov's uh, 100th anniversary. And um, uh, we would like to cover brief Q&A session and I'll uh, ki kick it off uh, mm -hmm. myself uh, with a question about your personal interest. Uh, what sparked your interest in, uh, in the Soviet dissident movement in Andrei Sakharov? How did you uh, start on this uh, scholarly path? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Walter. Um, uh, personally, it um, started because I was in Eastern Europe during the revolutions of 1989 and then I um, started to write a PhD thesis comparing the dissident movements in Eastern Central Europe and the Soviet Union. And I um, started off on a research trip to Moscow that was meant to be three months and um, at the end of a year I realized that Russia and Russian dissidents were my subject. Um, so that was basically how it happened. Thank you. Um, well, can you speak? Can you read Russian? The Kenyan, though. Right. <laughs> uh, but we do have some English speakers in the mm -hmm. audience, so the lecture is in English. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Q&A, uh, I hope every, everyone is fine. Mm -hmm. Continue in English. Yes, please. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, firstly, thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Navalny is ever invoked, like, any of Sakharov's ideas in his um, like, writing of the current situation. 
-hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, certainly since Sakharov, there's been no more prominent Russian victim of political repression than Navalny. Um, no one since Sakharov has, has become such a, a presence in the outside world's perception of Russia. In some ways, Navalny comes from a different space than Sakharov comes from. Um, part of Navalny's strategy is to build an alliance between Democrats and nationalists. Sakharov never really flirted with nationalism. Um, I can see moral arguments why um, Navalny's strategy makes sense. The level in which I can see a connection between Navalny's ideas and Sakharov's, and I don't think Navalny has ever articulated this explicitly, but there's a view of, of many Western commentators that the Putin regime's aggression on the international stage is about geopolitics and the, adva and the advancement of Russia's national interests. That the conflict with Georgia, the um, conflict with Ukraine, um, the general um, uh, tension with the West is all undertaken because Putin is a patriot advancing Russia's national interests. Navalny's argument is completely different. Navalny says Putin's authoritarianism combined with his kleptocracy and not wanting to go to jail is why he's doing this. That, um, uh, uh, for instance, Ukraine had um, an anti-authoritarian, anti-corruption revolution, the Euromaidan, and that's a scary example for Putin. And there were plenty of um, Russian activists who went to Kiev while that was in progress to learn how to get rid of their own corrupt dictator. So um, uh, Navalny's understanding of the relationship between dictatorship, the violation of human rights, and international peace closely echoes that of Sakharov. Wow, OK. It's um, um, pleased to meet you again, too. Yeah. Um, what's your name, by the way? Uh, James. James okay. Okay, thanks. Well, um, firstly, a lot of that um, uh, internet activity is being continued by Navalny's allies, by uh, uh, the people like uh, uh, Leonid Volkov and um, uh, Vladimir Milov and um, Lubov Sorbel and others. Second, I think both Navalny and Sakharov understood that exiles um, lose influence, that it is those who are sharing the fate of their own people um, who are going to have the greatest influence and the greatest authority when the regime begin, when things begin to change. I think, and particularly under the con in the context of authoritarian regimes that stigmatize every opponent as a pawn of the CIA and a pawn of the West. Um, 
The fact that Sarkov endured what he endured in Gorky, the fact that Navalny is now in prison, that is a total refutation of that line um, that um, they are somehow being controlled by others and serving foreign interests. And in Navalny's case, it's particularly effective because the main thing that he um, uh, has revealed is that the scale of the cosmopolitan offshore lifestyle of Putin's elite and of his propagandists who are always spouting propaganda about how patriotic they are and, and, and how Putin's critics are traitors um, whilst enjoying yachts and, um, uh, and um, uh, villas in the, in, in the um, French Riviera and um, apartments in Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, why did he assist them in the development of the H bomb? It's an interesting question. Um, firstly, um, this took place in the aftermath of the Second World War. Sakharov was still a young and brilliant scientist then. Um, his political awakening came later, particularly in the aftermath of Stalin's death when he became became involved in um, struggles within the scientific community over um, Lysenkoism. Um, uh, I, I think it's useful to remember, though, that Sakharov was an indoctrinated <coughs> Soviet citizen. Um, uh, after um, Stalin's death, he, um, uh, he wrote to his wife a letter along the lines of, um, I, I am in the awe of the death of a great man. I'm thinking of his humanity. Now, that was certainly not a position that Sakharov would have held five years later, but um, uh, the conditions of totalitarian states, particularly for scientists who are very focused on researching a, and, and thinking about a, a certain number of um, mathematical formulae, um, do not encourage critical debate and critical inquiry. Um, I, I think the entire history of the Soviet dissident movement and of the mass protests against Navalny is a refutation of that. I think that the very concept of the Russian psyche is absurd. Russia is an extremely rich and complex society with a vast number of conflicting positions that people hold. Um, and um, no, I mean, <laughs> if you think about the conditions of the authoritarian regime in Russia today, um, the fact that people are still prepared to go out in the streets and demonstrate, the fact that people are still prepared to join organisations that can have them labelled extremist, um, the fact that people take all the risks they do um, testifies quite the opposite. And I'd love to see Australians face similar conditions and see how well they'd perform. <laughs> did, um, did the Russian dissident movements have a different character from those in Eastern Europe? It's a very interesting question. Um, firstly, those in Eastern Europe themselves differed from country to country. Um, I think there were some that were closer, some that were less close. Um, the Polish dissident movement um, was heavily organised at the outset around the defence of workers, the Workers' Defence Committee that contributed to the Solidarity Trade Union and um, the uh, Hungarian dissident movement was much smaller um, and less focused on civil rights because rights were less violated in, um, uh, in communist Hungary with um, a, a more liberal system. Probably the Czechoslovak dissident movement was closest and historically um, people like um, Václav Havel got along well um, with um, the Russian human rights activists in the 1990s. Um, one interesting thing about the Soviet dissident movement, though, was that it discovered the idea of human rights before the East Central Europeans did. Um, the East Central Europeans were focused on other ideological d 
debates um, in uh, 1968. There was the Prague Spring and its aftermath, um, uh, whereas already in 1968, um, Soviet dissidents had taken up the human rights banner. Um, and in 1969, there was the Initiative Group on Human Rights appeal to the UN. Um, that kind of thing took place much later in East Central Europe. interesting question. Um, certainly the possibility of nuclear Armageddon was a major um, concern of Sakharov because he had been so close to the um, development of the Soviet Union's most destructive weapon. Um, uh, and a lot of his thinking about the relationship between human rights and um, peace was connected with that. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I have much more to say on that. Um, Sakharov's position was quite nuanced and quite sophisticated. He um, had various statements about how deterrence could work or would not work. Um, he was a, a, a critic of the um, Reagan administration's strategic defense initiative, its um, so-called Star Wars um, uh, um, uh, ballistic missile defense program. Um, but I, I have to admit, I, I'm not really a specialist on Sakharov's views on the complexities of international um, security and nuclear weapons policies. Yes. What was the question, sorry? If Sakharov was active today, would he be in prison? Um, I, 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 I think there's a pretty good chance he would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I think a lot would depend on how active he was. Um, there are um, quite old and outspoken Russian human rights activists who aren't in prison yet. Um, but um, certainly, certainly today he would be on, what's, uh, um, on what the regime calls a stop list. Um, stop lists prevent you from appearing on um, the evening news or television un unless, it's, unless you're being presented in a, a hostile way. Mm -hmm. when it was the, um, the power of the dissident movement that ultimately won. And although they were not probably not large numbers um, compared to today's opposition movement, yet they managed to persevere and push their agenda. So mm -hmm. what do you think? We're comparing um, apples and oranges in a way mm -hmm. when we talk about opposition versus dissidents. Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. um, so you're asking if the a dissident movement in the 1980s was stronger, would Russia be different, or are you asking whether today there was a stronger protest movement? If we had a stronger dissident movement as opposed to the opposition movement today, mm -hmm. would, it be, uh, would it have a, um, more chances to succeed? Mm -hmm. to succeed? Okay. Well, um, I think there are challenges with just applying the term dissident movement to contemporary circumstances. Um, arguably, there are some figures in Russian public life today who are still at liberty, but their condition um, can be um, described as being dissidents. And um, 
there are now plenty of political prisoners um, who also deserve that title. Um, if you're asking about um, if Russia had a stronger civil society, um, the, the civil society is where um, human rights activists and other people organize and discuss social questions. Um, there is um, certainly an argument that Russia today would be different if the civil society was stronger. But one of the main reasons why um, the civil society in Russia today is in such a bad way is that the Putin regime manipulates and controls civil society and regiments it through um, uh, the, um, the law on the foreign agents and extremist organizations and it um, puts pressure on um, people who donate to support civil society organizations um, and um, uh, it, it generally makes it difficult for um, people to um, organize to achieve goals that aren't purely political, that um, are, are goals that aren't purely about competing in the next election. Would you mind just clarifying the definition of the term dissident? Uh, people know the term opposition, they know, well, that there's a party in power and the opposition is trying to get them to power. But the term dissident, I think lots of people don't really have a mm -hmm. clarity of what it actually means. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, it's a, a term that's um, uh, certainly emerged um, during the late Soviet era. Um, until the 1970s, the term dissident was generally used to describe um, uh, religious dissenters in 19th century Russia. It was a purely historical term. Um, and it was coined to describe people who were not actually engaged in seeking political power, who um, weren't plotting a revolution, they um, weren't like the, the socialist um, revolutionaries or Narodna um, Volya before the revolution. Um, they were simply peacefully articulating a dissenting position on some question. Um, they were simply articulating their views. Um, I, I think that's the, the best um, the definition I can provide. It, it was certainly a definition that many dissidents themselves rejected because it suggested that they were cut off from the rest of the population. Um, and many of them felt that they were actually articulating the views of many people um, they knew who hadn't been publicly identified as dissidents. Um, basically from the text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, uh, Universal. Well, the, um, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was um, voted on by the UN's General Assembly on the 10th of December uh, 1948 and um, the, uh, the um, uh, 20th anniversary um, of the adoption of the um, declaration was the occasion for this rather grotesque um, international conference in Tehran um, where um, the Shah of Iran um, ruled a particularly brutal and despotic re regime that tortured lots of people. Um, and th that UN conference tried to redefine human rights to mean almost anything but what the Universal Declaration actually said. And the Soviet Union was a particularly aggressive participant in that conference and there was a fair amount of noise in Soviet newspapers at the time about this is human rights year and we're leading the way. Um, and it was that um, propaganda that um, uh, some Soviet dissidents um, took up in 1968 when they started to produce the Chronicle of Current Events, the main publication of the human rights movement in the Soviet Union. Um, and the 
the cover of every issue of the, um, of the early issues of the Chronicle of, of um, the Current Events was titled Human Rights Year in the Soviet Union, um, and it quoted Article 19 of the Universal Declaration, the article of the Universal Declaration that enshrines the right to freedom of expression, the, the freedom to freely impart and receive information regardless of borders. Um, and um, uh, that um, uh, um, UN declaration became um, foundational for the Soviet human rights movement. I think there is tremendous interest, yeah. Um, uh, um, I, um, uh, every um, year I um, uh, teach several courses about contemporary Russia and um, uh, there is tremendous interest um, from Australian students. I, I suppose I've seen a change over the past 20 years or so. Um, 20 years ago, there was less interest. Um, Russia attracted less attention. Um, in, in many ways, I, I wish the interest was inspired by um, Bulgakov and Tolstoy and Chekhov and not by the poisoning of the Skripals and what's been done to Navalny. But um, certainly there is um, enormous curiosity. Thank you.